good morning. Welcome to Rest of Bible Church. We are glad that you are here. We are in a series uh, in the book of Colossians. It's a 10-week series, and after today, we will be halfway done. Today is uh, week five. Want to do our scripture memory verse? It's the sa- actually the same verse from last week. Just want to do a review. We hope that you are committing these uh, scriptures to memory. It's really important to hide God's word in our heart. So it's Colossians 1.17. Let's say this out loud together. Here we go. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Awesome. Well, we've covered a lot so far. just want to do a very brief review. In one of our earlier weeks, we talked about how Paul prayed a prayer of thanks for all that the Colossians had grasped in terms of their hope, their faith, and then their love, and that he prayed for them uh, that they would then live that out, that they would discern God's will, uh, and that they would live it out in endurance, patience, and joy. Mike Myers covered the week where we talked about the foundational supremacy of Christ, this, this God-man uh, person that's like, what is that all about? And just the, the priority of Christ because of the challenges that the Colossian church is facing. We're going to talk about that today. Then last week, we talked about the reality that this supreme Christ, when we believe in him, he comes to, in ways that we don't fully understand, indwell those who are his followers. All of that sets the foundation for today, where we're going to talk about the threats to the church. The church has always faced threats, externally and internally, and we're going to talk about those today, a couple of them. Today we're going to be in Colossians chapter 2, it's verses 6 through 23. We're not going to read all of that, it's a big passage, but we're going to talk today about deceptive philosophies, the things from outside the church and inside the church from back then and then today that we need to think about as we press forward. So let's read some verses out of chapter 2 starting at verse 6. This is, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, a very critical verse for today, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. And then he reviews the foundations of the gospel. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And then he talks more about the internal threats, the internal inside the church. Therefore, Let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink or with regard to festival or new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray that as we jump in and kind of look at what was happening in the Colossian church and then bring that forward to some of the issues that we're facing today, I pray that you give us wisdom and power. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, again, this passage starts out, and it says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught. Now, as any good Bible student would, whenever you see the word therefore that begins a section, you have to ask yourself, what is the therefore? Therefore. The word therefore is transition. We go from what we taught it, talked about last week, this indwelling presence of God, to, well, what does that mean for us now? What are the things that they are facing? He talked about walking, as we've talked about in weeks previously, being rooted being rooted in the faith. A couple years ago, I had a tree uh, that kind of propped up on its own. It was an evergreen tree that was only a couple inches from my house, uh, the foundation of the house. And I thought, I'm going to give it a little time to grow and mature, and then I'm going to transplant it. What I didn't understand is that a three-foot high evergreen tree has about a three-foot taproot below the surface, right? So transplanting a three-foot tree was nearly impossible, 
because it, has, it was deeply rooted. And that's the idea of what Paul is saying here. Deeply rooted in the faith. The word faith here is a noun. It's the faith. The faith is the content of the gospel, which he goes on to elaborate on and summarize, summarize and elaborate on in this passage, right? So verse 9, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. We've covered that two weeks ago. The amazing and powerful reality of Jesus, the God-man. And you have been filled in him. That deity, we talked about this last week, that this one then comes and lives because it says we were dead in our trespasses and the uncircumcision of our flesh. God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. If you are with us today and you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, this passage is speaking to you. It is that you needing to understand the reality of our debt that we cannot pay because we are fallen and sinful and that Jesus took all of our sin and he nailed it to the cross. If you've never talked with Jesus about receiving his righteousness in exchange for your sin, it's our prayer that you would do that today. Well, Paul talks about two sets of challenges that the church in Colossae were facing. They were facing threats from outside and threats from inside. And I want to take a few minutes and talk about each of those, and then we're going to talk about our threats from outside and inside here a couple thousand years later. Verse 8, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. You see, about this time in the first century, for several hundred years, Greek philosophy had been permeated the culture. And so just like any generation, our generation, any generation, we are bathing in culture that we need to understand, that influences us. And one of the things that's true in our home is that my wife always likes to have music playing in the background. The TV's on with the soundscapes or Christian music. Something's always playing. It's weird when we sit down to dinner and we go to eat and we're like, it's so quiet. Oh, the music's not playing. There's not that background. Culture is like that. It's always playing in the background. It's ministering to you. And you need to understand it. And the Colossians were immersed. They were bathing in Greek culture. We see this in Acts chapter 17. Paul's in the middle of his uh, second missionary journey. He makes it to the city of Athens. Acts 17, verse 18. Some of the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers, just two of the many streams of Greek philosophical thought of the day, also uh, uh, conversed with him and said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection, which was foreign to them, and he engaged the philosophers of the day. Now, what what is the foundation of all of these different Greek philosophies that would take us weeks and weeks to unpack? The foundation is truly, basically, humanism. The foundation of Greek philosophical thought was that man is the measure There was no metaphysical world, no supernatural world. If there is, we can't know it. It doesn't matter. It's it's what we can see here. There were the Stoics who reflect most accurately humanism of today. The Stoics believe that knowledge of the world is gained through observation, experimentation, and rational analysis. Does that sound familiar? It should. Humans are the integral part of all of the world, Fulfillment emerges through individual participation in service of human ideals. Very altruistic. That sounds familiar. And supernatural, not much time for that. The second group that we see in Acts chapter 17, there was the Stoics, but there were also the Epicureans. That's just a fancy word for pleasure. They were the seekers of pleasure. Now, since the world is just physical, it's just what we can see and taste and touch and feel and all that, then pleasure for ourselves is high. Now, now in the first century, it wasn't reflective quite what it is today. To them, pleasure was primarily focused on friendship, tranquility. It was not overindulgent. It could be, but it generally was not. 
So humanism, whenever we find it in history, seems to always have a subset of people seeking pleasure. We see that today. Because if this physical world, there's nothing beyond it to them. So that was outside. That was the outside influences that, they, that Paul was trying to speak out against. Stop letting these deceptive philosophies that are human-focused, not God-focused, infiltrate the church. There were also some challenges from inside, secondarily. Dealing with a variety of threats from within. We find that in verse 18. It says, Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head. Why do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom and promoting self-made religion and asceticism. Now, legalism was a critical element of the day, and we have our own issues of legalism today. But in that day, they were facing some religious legalism from within, primarily based because the church still had significant Jewish roots. Most of the believers at this time initially were Jewish people who came to follow Jesus. And then things got really complicated, as we've talked about, when the Gentiles started to believe. What do we require of them? Acts chapter 15 the Jerusalem leaders decided, hey, we cannot put a weight of these Old Testament Jewish laws on the backs of Gentiles, things that we couldn't obey ourselves. And by the way, they were only ever supposed to point us to our need, not something that we actually expected to be able to live up to. Why are we requiring that of them? God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Paul says there is no place for legalism in the church. This asceticism, which is the denial of self-pleasure at all, as if that's spiritual, that is out. There was, a, there was a growing angel worship, worship, worship of supernatural beings, we don't see a whole lot of that today, but, but it does exist in our world. Irenaeus, in his book Against, Against Heresies in 182 AD, spoke about the pervasive and widespread practice of angel worship. The primary challenge to the Colossians, however, in addition to legalism, was mysticism. Verse 18, Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. There was a combination of self-denial, asceticism, with a preoccupation with supernatural beings and a preoccupation with visions driven by the flesh. And one of the things you're going to see throughout, I'm just going to say it now, we'll come back to it again. There are three things at play in our Christian walk at all times. Three things in play, three dynamics. There's God, there's our enemy, and there's our flesh. These three are always at work. Is what's going on up here, is it from God? Is what's going on up here from the enemy? Is what's going on up here from my own flesh? It's a great question. How do we know? That's what we're going to talk about in just a little while. They were struggling through the reality that in the early church, people were pursuing the supernatural over pursuing Jesus. If we pursue Jesus and God does something supernatural, fabulous. They were coupled with the, 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 the pursuit of visions. That really then, it says, people were getting puffed up in their sensuous mind. Now, sensuous doesn't equal sensual. That's what we think. Equals sexual. It's not that. It simply means fleshly. Essentially, here is the bottom line. The pursuit of the experiential had become a focus in the Colossian church in the place of the pursuit of Jesus. In place of the pursuit of Jesus. Remember, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things. It is desperately wicked. Who can understand it? The message is that I have something going on in here. And the place where I, my heart is 
more often deceptive than anywhere else is with me, is with me. I want to move from what they were dealing with in the first century, the external threats and the internal threats, and spend a large majority of our time today talking about what are our external threats and internal threats. Before we get there, two points of clarification. One, all deceptive philosophies, all deceptive philosophies that we will ever face have certain elements of truth. That is Satan's way. You see something in a philosophy, and you go, well, that's true. That, may even, that element may even be consistent with the Bible. Or that makes sense. Anybody can see that that's true. The question isn't, are there elements of truth? The question is, is the foundation based on truth and is the, therefore the solution to the problem or the assessment of the problem true? Not are there elements of truth in the philosophy. The second thing. You've heard me say this. You're going to hear me say it today. You're going to hear me say it in the future. And you're going to get tired of hearing me say it. We all exist in a cultural context that we are bathed in all day long. And one of my hopes through the time together today is that you would ask yourself the question, have I fallen prey to this in some way, shape, or form without realizing it because I exist in an environment that is training my mind all day, every day, like the background noise of music in my home? And unless you ask yourself the question, how have I become subject to this? You will never truly be able to separate out what is a worldly deceptive philosophy and what is from the Bible. The primary threat to the church today is the same threat that it was to the church in the first century, which is humanism. It is humanism. It is the reality in their minds that man is the measure. God doesn't find a place. There's that place for pleasure. There was modernism of the 20th century that was primarily intellectual, which gave way to postmodernism, which has taken our entire culture, including the church, in an experientially focused direction. The moral code of today is lessons learned from experience, not external truth. Truth is not from within. It is external. Growing out of the postmodern movement of experience comes the sexual revolution. It wasn't that long ago that by generally in the culture, people believed that sex outside of marriage was inappropriate. Your parents, your grandparents, great-grandparents, not that long ago. Which gave way to Woodstock and free love, which gave way to all sorts of gender challenges, and here we are today. When I worked in the psychiatric hospital in the mid-80s, the only thing that teenagers did not have to talk about in group therapy was any sexual identity struggles. It was the one thing they didn't have to talk about. Because outside of group therapy, they would have some problems with their peers. By the mid-90s, it became stylish for girls in group therapy to talk about being bisexual, but never the boys. And you see where we are going. You see where we are going. Forty years ago, the word transgender didn't functionally exist in anyone's mind.
Abigail Schreier, a self-proclaimed liberal who believes that if you are an adult and you want to go have changes biologically done to your body to reflect your internal sense of differences about your gender, she's fine with that. She wrote a book called Irreversible Damage about the phenomena among teenage girls today, which she says is entirely out of the question. It's entirely uh, dysfunctional. That girls in mass as friend groups are declaring themselves transgender. And now they can go to Planned Parenthood, which is one of the largest providers of hormone therapy in the nation. They aren't just an abortion provider. Their cash industry is becoming hormone therapy. 30 years ago, girls used to go to the mall in a group to go to the piercing pagoda, to get their ears pierced as a way of rebelling against their parents. Today, they're going to Planned Parenthood as a group without their parents' knowledge or permission to get hormone therapy. This is humanism at its ultimate. Gender ideology views the person as material, autonomous, and self-defining. Humanism. It rejects the idea of human nature and denies the significance of sexual differences. Thus, it champions the person's supposed right to self-define on the basis of feelings. Gender ideology asserts it is possible to be born in the wrong body, a scientifically erroneous claim, that the body is merely a canvas for self-expression, a dualistic separation of body and will. It justifies medical interventions to modify the body according to the person's desires as the legitimate expression of individual autonomy and a path toward authenticity. And this is taking over in the teenage community of the church. And it is humanism. And it denies the reality of Genesis 127 that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And if you have small children and you are in the public school system, I don't want to scare you. Actually, I do. I do want to scare you. Because this messaging is what your children are getting day in and day out. It is the background noise of their life. I'm about to talk about another element of of humanism in our culture. One is the sexual revolution, and then this one. And if you are a little older, You may not know the words that I'm about to use. They may be new to you. You didn't grow up with these. The younger you are, the more challenged you are going to feel by what I'm about to say, and I'm asking you right now, please do not close your ears. Please do not do that. The single threat from my perspective as I look at culture and I look at the Bible is something that is is pervasive in our culture. And again, are there shreds of truth? Yes, that is the hook. Is the foundational assessment faulty? Yes. Is the solution faulty? Absolutely. The theory is not a philosophy. It claims to be philosophical, but it's really sociological. Sociology began in the mid-1800s. It's a perspective not about ideas, that's philosophy. It's about dynamics, that's sociology. And it talks about dynamics. And it is critical theory. It's critical theory. Now, it's often heard as critical race theory. And the first thing I want you to understand is I refute the use of the word race in any of these conversations. Acts 17 says that from one man, God made every nation of men that they should inhabit the earth. We are one race with many ethnicities. We are one race. We have more in common than we have different. Critical theory says that foundationally we are established in groups. It's about separation, not unity. You are from a group. 
primarily based on your immutable characteristics, things that you can't change. And it's group against group. You are representative of your group and you are trapped in your group. You always reflect your group. That's not true. Your group always reflects you. That's not true. This is anti-biblical. Jesus says that we have two things in common. We are all sinners and that he loves us all the same. That's the foundation of who we are. You are more than your immutable characteristics. Foundationally, we are one race. The second thing that critical theory says is that all these, these groups, it's all about power. It's all about power. It's all about who's on top and who's on the bottom. And the dynamics are always shifting and the ones on the bottom are always trying to get rid of the ones on top. You need to understand that the Bible never speaks negatively about power. It only speaks negatively about the abuse of power. Not all relationships equal inequality. It does in critical theory. Always. And even where there's a power dynamic in relationships, it doesn't mean that it's always bad. It doesn't mean that there's always somebody who's oppressing and always someone who's the oppressor. Jim, are you saying we don't have challenges in our culture? Are you saying we don't have race challenges? I am not saying that at all. We have serious brokenness in our culture. Yes, we do. We have serious abuse of different people by other people in our culture. Yes. And your experience of challenges that you have faced because of your immutable characteristics, if that is the case, I believe that is real and I am sorry that that happens and Jesus grieves for that. That is not the way he intended life to be. But whoever mishandled you isn't the sum total of their group. (laughs) You don't want to be blamed for everything that someone in your group does, do you? If power was always bad, and in the humanistic mind of critical theory it is, then God has no place because God has ultimate power, which means that you should always rebel against God in critical theory. If power power is always bad, then the culture will try to free your children from your control. And that's what it's doing because you are oppressing your children according to the outgrowth of critical theory, which is why your child as a teenager can go do things without your permission and why counselors and doctors and so forth can talk to your children or willing to talk to your children outside of your awareness. The reality is that there are problems in relationships where there's control or power. Yeah, there are. But not in every relationship. The Bible says that the abuse of power is the problem. So we have groups, we have power, and then the definition of liberation. The definition of liberation in critical theory is that the oppressed would always throw off the oppressor. That's liberation. Which means that the only sinful people in the critical theory mind are the oppressors. In the Bible, all of us are sinners. All of us are sinners. Liberation in the Bible is freedom from your sin. Look through the New Testament about all of the challenges. Paul was of all people the most oppressed. The man was sitting in Acts chapter 16 in a Philippian jail with his feet in stocks and yet he was free, singing hymns. Liberation doesn't equal freedom from oppression in this life. You look all over the world and there are Christians who are oppressed living in freedom and liberation because salvation is different in the Bible. In 2019, the superintendent of Loudoun County Public Schools put out a statement related to some of these issues, and I I won't articulate it for you. It's completely unbelievably offensive. And what it did for me is it sent me on a journey. It sent me on a journey to meet with people at every level who didn't look like me. I met with 
law enforcement. I met with county officials. I met with principals. I met with graduates, young adults. I met with students, teachers, none of whom looked like me. Over two dozen to simply ask the question, tell me what life is like. Help me understand what life is like in your skin. Tell me what I don't know. Because nothing that critical theory offers has anything to do with relationships and unity. Not one recommendation. That's the Bible's territory. The Bible says, here, meaning in this church, Colossians, and in this church, RBC, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. And then he adds ladies, male and female, into the mix in Galatians 3 when he says there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, they are, we are all one in Christ. He took the extremes of everything that they faced in culture and he said, I am obliterating all of that. Stop with the talk about your immutable characteristics. You have more in common in Jesus than you have different in anything else. In the Colossian church, there were Jews who believed in Jesus who were still working through what they were and they weren't allowed to eat. And I'm guessing that there were Jews in that church who wouldn't eat certain meats because it still harkened back to their Old Testament days. And in this same church, they have Scythians. Remember who we said the Scythians are? They were from the north and they were cannibals. So I have a Jewish guy who won't eat certain meats and now I have a Scythian who's not going to eat people. That's good. That's good. And somehow, this guy who's not a, who won't eat certain means, and this guy who's willing to eat anything, they're going to follow Jesus together. They're going to follow Jesus together. So my recommendation for you is in all of these dynamics, start with what we have in common. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. No matter what your skin color is, you're a sinner. And Jesus loves us all the same. Let's start there and let's get to know each other and have conversations about our differences. And I've had some powerful, awesome, wonderful conversations with people who have had very difficult struggles because of some of these things. And it has broken my heart and we are able to walk together shoulder to shoulder through life together in unity. And critical theory won't offer that to anybody. And it is creeping into the church and it needs to stop. The second piece that I want to talk about today, about what's creeping into the church, isn't from outside. It's from inside. It's not from outside, it's from inside. And my former pastor used to always say, um, I'm about to go from preaching to meddling. And that's the transition. If you thought what I just said was potentially difficult, what I'm about to say, it's really difficult. Because what I want to talk about now is also part of what they faced in the first century, which is the infiltration, the infusion of modern mysticism into the church. If you remember what I said, in the, in the, in the 2000s, I'm sorry, in the 20th century, the church grew up in kind of the modern world of intellectual thinking. We've moved into the postmodern world, which focuses more on experiential. What, exper what's ex what I experience is what's true. In the current world, bleeding into the church and rising up. Now, let me just say, I believe that God is a supernatural being who does supernatural things. A couple weeks ago, my wife backed our minivan into the driveway minivan's 14 years old. It doesn't owe us anything. And as she backed into the driveway, she heard this big snot, snap, loud pop. And I went out to examine the car, and I, I, the front left tire was going this way, and the front right tire was going this way, and I thought, well, that's not good. And what we discovered is that the, the, tie, rod, the tie rod, the, the, the control arm, if you, if you will, snapped. It rusted through and snapped. In talking with our mechanic, he basically said, if that had happened, 
while you were driving at almost any rate of speed. It could have been catastrophic, and the loss of life would be likely. What are the human odds that that control arm snapped as she came three feet from her resting place in our driveway instead of somewhere out there on the road? Don't tell me God doesn't do supernatural things. He protected my family that day, and I believe it. So I'm not about to say that God isn't at work and God isn't active. The question isn't whether God communicates to us. The question is, how does God communicate to us? Keep that in mind as we move forward. God communicates to us. He does. The question is, how does he do it? So I want to put a graphic up on the screen, kind of with a continuum of of communication. At the one end of the communication, it says, well, God doesn't communicate at all. This is our world. They don't believe in him. They don't believe, they're agnostic at best. If he exists, he has nothing to do with us. He doesn't communicate. That's the essence of humanism. We do not believe that. The second element uh, on the continuum of communication is that God communicates through what we call general revelation. Romans 1.20 says, For his immutable attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that, that have been made so that they are without excuse. When you wake up and you look out your window and it's the most amazing sunrise you've ever seen, God is communicating to you. He's communicating his existence and his power. When you look at a little baby, a newborn, and you are in awe of how any of this is possible and how any of these babies survive, ladies, you know what I'm talking about, right? How hard is it on you? How hard is it on them? And you you are struck by the communication from God to you about him. Does he do that? He does every day. And you should stand in awe of every second of that. The next thing that God does in his communication with us is what we call special revelation. Special revelation. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. God breathed his word through human beings, recorded it here, and gave it to us so that we have everything we need to know about what he thinks, about everything we need to know about. I know that doesn't tell you what college to go to or who to marry, but let me say this. If you spend 95% of your life trying to live this out, The 5% of everything else that's not revealed in here, that will come. If you spend a lot of time seeking all of answers to all of this, without looking at this, you're not going to hear correctly over here. You with me? And today, people want information about this without focusing on this. And if you aren't seeking to live this out and root out the areas of your life that are inconsistent with this, God is under no obligation to communicate clearly to you about this. God revealed everything we need to know in his special revelation. It says in Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. That's the way he did it then. God is changing his plan, his program. He's got a new route that he's going to take. And he says, but in these last days, what last days? The days from Jesus' first appearance to his second appearance are all the last days. In these days, he has spoken to us by his son. Where do we learn about his son? Right here. whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he has created the world. So God gives us his word. The next thing he does, as we've talked about several times, last week and this week as well, he gives us his indwelling presence to kind of help sort it all out. And we are told that we are to walk in the spirit 
and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. A way to stop listening to this, remember we have God, we have the enemy, and we have ourselves. The way to stop listening to this is to walk in tandem with this in the power of the Holy Spirit, his indwelling presence. Another element that God provides along the way is wise counsel. And we could put Bible verse after Bible verse after Bible verse. If you've read God's word and you've prayed and you've sought the Holy Spirit's wisdom on that word and you think God is leading you in a direction, the next best step is to talk to a couple of people who you consider wise to see if what you're thinking seems to be in alignment with what God is doing. Seeking wise counsel. At the other end of the continuum is God speaks to me directly. And here's where we cross a line of great concern. 40 years ago, 45 years ago when I met Jesus, people never used the phrase, God told me. God told me. What they would say is, I've read God's word and I've prayed and I've tried to lean into the Holy Spirit and I've sought wise counsel and here's what I think the direction is that God's leading me to go in. In our experientially driven world, in moving in this direction, the pursuit of what I would call direct revelation has been on the rise. Rather than reading God's revelation and praying for the illumination of the Holy Spirit about his revelation, more and more people are seeking direct revelation. Sarah Young, in her devotional, Jesus Calling, which has taken the evangelical world by storm, said this in her introduction. She said, I knew God communicated with me through the Bible, but I yearned for more. Stop. Stop. Is God's word and the Holy Spirit insufficient for your life? It is not. It is everything that you need for life and godliness. It is everything that you need. I wanted to hear what God had to say to me personally, she went on, on a given day. This is what God has to say to you on a given day, on any given day. And as God illuminates the revelation that he has given us, God is speaking to me. God is speaking to me. So you go to your quiet time this week and you're reading Philippians 2 and you're reading all about the humility of Jesus and how he gave up his rights and how we should be like Jesus in all humility. And, 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 and God brings me to mind and you start praying for me. And as you're praying and you're reading, you're thinking, you know, Jim has some new responsibilities. He's preaching more. And, uh, you know, the, the platform is really seductive. And, you know, I just feel like, I just feel urged to go talk to Jim and encourage him. Jim, you're doing a great job up there, but just stay humble because these new responsibilities could be intoxicating. Don't get prideful, brother. I'm praying for you. Totally awesome. But don't come to me, please, and say, God told me that you are prideful and that you need to be humble. <laughs> mm, not so much. Or I'm praying for a brother. I'm praying for a brother. And God brings Psalm 101 to mind. And it says, I will walk in my house with a blameless heart. I will set before my eyes no vile thing. The deeds of faithless men I hate, they will not cling to me. And I go, Lord, I wonder if my brother is struggling with pornography. And I go to my brother and I say, you know, I was praying for you the other day and the Lord brought Psalm 101 to mind. And I don't know what's going on in your life, but I just want to encourage you. Are, are, I just want, are, are you struggling? He says, oh man, the Lord just really put that together. I would never go to him and say, the Lord told me you're struggling with pornography. I've had couples in my office. She says the Lord's saying this. He says the Lord's saying that. Those two things disagree. Who's the Lord speaking to? 
Do you see the slippery slope of a world that pursues the direct revelation from God? It's hard to talk to somebody who says, God told me. What do I do with that? How do we know? Are you really sure? January 6th, there was a rally. Did you see the number of evangelical Christians that came across the stage with prophetic utterances that have not come true? It's shocking. And it reflects on all of us. The world believes that we are like that because we are evangelical Christians. The pursuit of the prophetic is eating the church alive from inside. I worked with a nonprofit several years ago. I founded it. <laughs> and the executive director started bringing in prophets to prophesy over the team. And I said, Really? What is the prophet saying? The prophet told me that I am suited for this, that, that I am suited for this leadership position and I'm doing a great job. And I said, That's not prophecy. I said, That is discernment coupled with encouragement, which are clearly seen in the Bible, and I'm glad you were encouraged, but that is not prophecy. That is not prophecy. And an Old Testament prophet was ever wrong, was ever, was, if they were ever wrong, it did not go well for them. They were stoned to death. Should we have the same standard today? Please don't, please don't speak for God in ways that are supra-scripture, but in an experiential world, that's what's happening. I don't know if you're familiar with A Christmas Carol with Ebenezer Scrooge. It's lovely, it's a wonderful, heartwarming story filled with incredibly valuable principles. It's not even remotely biblical. Where Jacob Marley is standing in front of his friend Ebenezer Scrooge, as a ghost, and he says, why do you doubt your senses? And Ebenezer responds, because a little thing affects them. He said, you're a piece of undone beef or a blot of mustard, he says. We have God, we have the enemy, and we have our heart, all working at the same time. And to assume that everything that goes through your head is a direct word from God is a great concern. And if it doesn't reflect this, it's of super great concern. I've had men come to me and say, I believe that God, is, God brought this wonderful woman into my life, and God's calling me to divorce my wife and marry this woman. I'm saying, I don't know what you're listening to, but it is not God. It is not God. So my challenge to you today With regard to what's going on in our world, we can't fix all of what's happening and all the, the messages that are coming, but we can do a way better job of pursuing unity in the church as we recognize our common realities of being sinners who are loved by Jesus. And I challenge you today to find someone or a, a several someones who are not like you and ask them, tell me what life is like in your skin brother or sister. And let's defeat the humanism that is grounded in that, in all of it, with the truth of God's word, which is to walk together as one race with many ethnicities for the glory of God. And when it comes to the internal, the mysticism, and the things that are happening here, I want to challenge you to pour yourself into this book. I find when people pursue more experience in their journey, they tend to slip on the Bible. Focus on God's word. Seek to conform your life to what he has already revealed. And all of those other decisions that you are worried about that are very real will come to greater clarity when you pursue his word, illuminated by his Holy Spirit in the context of community and wise counsel. God will direct you. He will. He does communicate to us. Seek Jesus over revelation. If God wants to do something 
crazy wild in your life, something supernatural? Can God speak to you? I, I, I'm not going to tell you what God can and cannot do. But pursue Jesus first, not the supernatural movement. And when you pursue him, leave all that to him. And he will show up in ways that will surprise you. We live in a world that it's challenging more than ever to discern what's true. Things, external threats, internal threats. And it's very important that we live with a, with a critical mind. I don't mean a negative mind. I mean a, a critical thinking mind. Renewing our mind. Checking our feelings, not leading with what we feel, but allowing feelings to be a part of the journey where they belong. Not leading the way, but growing out of a renewed mind. Understanding what's true based in God's word. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your grace. We ask, Lord God, that you would help us. Lord, we live in troubled times, difficult, difficult times. The messaging that we hear all around us is so hard to discern our way through, and I pray, God, that you would give us your grace to follow you in the power of your spirit, we pray in your name. Amen.